Okay, so how do you change somebody's mind? What are, what are the steps to that? Yeah, you know, and I would say in general, we focus, as I mentioned, on pushing, uh, right? We think if I just provide more reasons, more facts, more figures, more information, uh, people will come around. And it makes sense why we think that, right? You know, if there's a chair in the middle of the room and we want to move that chair, pushing is a great way to move that chair, right? If I push that chair, that chair will go. When we apply that same intuition to people, though, there's one place we get stuck, which is that people aren't chairs. Right? When we push people, they don't just go, they often push back. They often think about all the reasons why what we're suggesting is wrong, why they don't want to do it, and they often sometimes even do the exact opposite uh, of what we suggest. And so the question is, could there be a, a better way to change minds? And, and it turns out an interesting approach actually comes from chemistry. And so if any of your listeners have a background in chemistry, they'll probably uh, understand what I'm saying very quickly. But it's not surprising that chemical change is really hard. Right? If you want to turn carbon into diamonds or you want to turn plant matter into petroleum, it takes thousands, if not millions uh, of years. And so uh, chemists often add temperature and pressure to make it happen faster. You think about a, a popcorn kernel, for example, you want to make popcorn, you stick the kernels in the microwave, adds a lot of uh, heat, heats up those kernels, adds pressure inside the kernel, pops uh, the popcorn. And so temperature and pressure are usually the way to go. Uh, but there are a special set of substances that chemists often use uh, that make change happen faster and easier. Uh, these substances clean the grime on your contact lenses as well uh, as the grime on your car's engine. Uh, they've helped uh, scientists win uh, dozens uh, of Nobel Prizes, and they're inside many of the products we use uh, every day. But what's neatest about them is the way that they work. They don't increase the temperature, and they don't increase the pressure. They actually make the same amount of change happen with essentially less effort. And what they do is they lower the barrier to change. Uh, and these things are called catalysts, right? And what catalysts do is they don't add temperature, they don't add pressure, they don't push harder. They figure out what's preventing change and they mitigate those barriers. And so that's exactly what the book is, is all about. How can we change minds and drive action, not by pushing harder, but by figuring out what the barriers or obstacles are that are preventing change and, and mitigate them. I think a, a good way to think about it is, you know, if you're parked on a hill, get inside your car, you want to get it to go, you step on the gas. If it doesn't go, you think you just need more gas. Sometimes we don't need more gas. Sometimes we just need to depress the parking brake. And so what the book is all about is kind of, well, what are those parking brakes that are preventing change from happening? What are the common barriers or obstacles that are stopping things from going? And how, by identifying those barriers, can we change anything? It's one of the things that I think has been really cool about doing this interview series is kind of seeing how a lot of these ideas um, mesh together with what other people have talked about. And we had yeah. Chris Voss, the author of Never Split the Difference on uh, yeah. about a month ago. He was talking about how in negotiation, so many people want to talk about like the positive benefits of doing a deal with you, but they never address all of the barriers of why you wouldn't want to deal, yes. do the deal. And, um, and he's like, if you keep pushing the positives, but you never address the negatives, those are always going to be more powerful. So you have to kind of disable those before you can go into the other side. And that kind of seems like what you're talking about here. You got to take the parking brake off. Yeah, it's certainly related. And, and, you know, I think it's a good way to think about it. You know, the more you push someone, if they're digging in their heels, you can add more pressure, but the more pressure you add, the more resistance they're going to put up. And so it's really about kind of well, what are those obstacles and how can we mitigate them to make all sorts of change easier? So what are those obstacles? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I like frameworks. Uh, and so this is also <laughs> a framework book. My, my second book, Invisible Influence, uh, which is the one we're not talking about today, that is not a framework book. So if you, if you want a Jonah Berger book that doesn't have a framework, <laughs> check that one out. Uh, but uh, The Catalyst, which is, uh, just, just came out recently, um, talks about five common barriers that we've seen, uh, whether you know, talking to great salespeople, talking to great leaders, talking to hostage negotiators, talking to substance abuse counselors, uh, you know, even talking about a guy who got someone to renounce the KKK, sort of a, a you know, grand dragon or whatever the KKK got him to renounce the KKK and give it up. And again and again, looking across these sort of disparate areas, I tended to see sort of the same approaches being, being used. And so the book talks about five common barriers, uh, reactance, uh, endowment, distance, uh, uncertainty, uh, and corroborating evidence. Uh, put together, they spell a word, and that is reduce. Uh, and that's exactly what great catalysts do. They don't push harder. They reduce those barriers. And so each of the chapters, similar to Contagious, talks a little about the psychology of how those barriers work, why they're a barrier in the first place, uh, and gives some examples of how to mitigate them and some tools so that people can apply them to their own lives. Do you have any, uh, any favorite stories from the book that of examples where companies have kind of implemented some of these pieces? 
Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll give one quick example because I think it's um, uh, an easy one that's relevant in today's day and age. I um, recently wrote a piece for HBR kind of about uh, how to apply some of the ideas in the, in the current uh, situation where are, we are in the world. Um, and so I'll give you an example from reactants, which I think is a fun one. So um, many of your listeners are probably familiar with Tide Pods. Um, you probably remember these little things that you drop in the laundry uh, so you don't have to measure out the detergent. You just put a pod uh, in the laundry. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story about, about Tide Pods. So um, sort of over a decade now, uh, over a decade, Tide was thinking about, hey, how can we make laundry easier to, to do? Uh, no muss, no fuss. So they came out with these things called Tide Pods. Basically, easier. Laundry is an over billion dollar market. They spent over $150 million on marketing. They thought they could take a big chunk of that market by making something new, adding a little technology, adding some chemistry, make doing laundry easier. So they released Tide Pods uh, and Tide Pods do okay. They do quite well, in fact, uh, but then there's a problem, uh, which is that people are eating them. Uh, now, I'm going to pause there for a second. Uh, if you're listening and going, well, people are eating them, Aren't they full of chemicals? You're exactly right. They are full of chemicals, yet people are eating them. Uh, why? Because uh, College Humor came out with a funny video. The Onion came out with sort of a funny article saying they looked good enough to eat. Uh, and soon, mainly young people were challenging each other online to eat Tide Pods. It was called the Tide Pod Challenge. Now, uh, imagine you're tied, uh, Procter & Gamble in this situation. Uh, people are out there eating Tide Pods. What do you do? You do what any company does in this situation. You tell them not to. So Tide, uh, Procter & Gamble released a press release saying, don't eat Tide Pods. And in case that wasn't enough, they hire celebrity football player Rob Gronkowski to tell people not to eat Tide Pods. So they put these videos online, they post them on social media, they think that will be the end of it. Okay, well, they hoped that uh, telling people not to eat Tide Pods would decrease interest uh, in Tide Pods. That's not what happened. Uh, uh, and it wasn't that it had no change either. Uh, in the days after uh, Procter & Gamble released their messaging, uh, searches for Tide Pods went up over 400% online. Uh, and it wasn't just from people who were trying to figure out why Tide was telling people the obvious. Visits to poison control shot up as well. In the next two weeks, uh, more people visited poison control than had in the two years previously. Essentially, a warning became a recommendation. Telling people not to do something made them more likely uh, to do it. And so uh, the first chapter talks all about this. It's a silly example, but it's an example of a principle of reactance. When we push people, when we try to get people to do something, when we try to persuade them, they know we're trying to do that. And so they react or push back against us. Essentially, people have an anti-persuasion radar, right? They detect incoming attempts. Uh, when we call them, try to pitch them something on the phone, we send them an email, when an ad comes on the television, they ignore the messages, they avoid them, or even worse, they counter-argue. They think about all the reasons why what we're suggesting is wrong. They're not just listening, right? They're poking holes in our arguments. It's going to be too expensive. It's going to be difficult to implement. It's not going to work. Almost like a high school debate team member. Uh, and so this barrier, this anti-persuasion radar, makes it really hard to change minds. Uh, and so what that chapter is all about is how can we stop persuading people? How can we stop pushing them? and get them to persuade themselves? How can we try to stop selling them on things, but get them to buy in? Giving them choices, for example, so they feel like they have more of a role to play. Asking questions rather than telling them things, which encourage them to come up and guide their journey down, uh, down the path. Um, uh, highlight a gap, point out a gap between their attitudes and their actions, or what they would recommend for someone else and what they're doing themselves. Happy to talk more in depth about any of these, but sort of all of them are strategies to reduce that reactance, to get people to listen, uh, and to get them to change. Do you like what you just saw? Well, great, because our YouTube channel is chock full of tips on how to grow your online business and learn from the best in the industry. So make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss out. And if you're looking for the absolute best software for entrepreneurs at the lowest possible price, then you should absolutely head over to AppSumo.com and subscribe to our email list. Heck, we'll even throw in 10% off your first order just to make it a no-brainer. Now, you're in on one of the best-kept secrets in software.